Hey, this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Coming to you live today. It's Monday, May 18th, 2020. And I'm going to start doing something a little different today with my live stream. Typically, hey, good morning, Brother Lee Davis. Hope you're doing well. So typically I do something that is, oh, perhaps question-based. Somebody who's been watching my live streams will send a question or maybe a comment while I'm going live and so that'll lead to something else that I'm doing and so it's kind of I won't say haphazard but not necessarily structured from day to day uh, yeah <laughs> yeah thanks David I'll see if I can remember that <laughs> um, starting today I'm gonna be a little more structured with what I'm trying to do I typically go have been going about 30 to 40 minutes on a variety of subjects what I'm going to start trying to do today is go for about 20 minutes to 25 minutes, and we're going to start a study of Luke's account of the life of Christ today. And do that each day, Monday through Thursday, 11 Central Time each time. And I think it'll be beneficial. I know it will be to me. Maybe it will be to you as well. Hello, Miss Norma. Good to see you today on here. So just in thinking about where to start a study like this, you know, you've got four accounts of the life of Christ, and um, I wanted to start with Luke. I there's not that I, not that I have a favorite account of the life of Christ. Each is unique in its own right, but I I enjoy the study of Luke. Luke is um, 24 chapters, so chapters wise, it's not the longest account. However. Uh, Verse-wise, it is. There are uh, 1,151 verses in Luke's account of the life of Christ. So in that sense, it is the longest account. But it's interesting in the way it's written. So I guess here's where I want to start in talking today, uh, in studying today about Luke and uh, his his account of Jesus' life. Uh, hey, Uncle Rob, good to see you on here today up in Cottersport, Pennsylvania. Hope you're doing well. Luke is unique in his uh, in his delivery, in his content. And, well, here's the thing. When you look at particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so when you're studying introductions to these books and kind of, the, you know, the textual evidence for each book, there's this teaching, there's this idea out there where the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. And basically the idea is, um, in some circles, it's called the synoptic problems. In other words, you have these three accounts that basically, some say borrowed from each other, some say copied from each other. There's a, there's a theory out there that Mark, since it's the shortest account, Mark wrote first, and then Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark. I'm not getting into all that. I'm just letting you know that that idea is out there. Um, that position you know, believing that way is, is kind of a, uh, it's, well, it's a, it's a reflection on the idea of biblical inspiration. You know, if, if Mark wrote and then Matthew and Luke borrowed, and some would even say copied from Mark, then where, you know, where does inspiration then come into the picture? We need to be careful when we, you know, when people need to be careful when they're saying those kinds of things. And, and again, that, you know, this is not everyday Christianity. This is some of those more, uh, that would be some of those more what I, what I would call academic pursuits. Uh, looking at the biblical text, the origins of the biblical text. Luke did not copy off of Mark and Matthew. I don't even think he borrowed off of Mark and Matthew. Again, that would be, that would be um, to kind of downplay the role of the Holy Spirit in inspiring not only Luke, but Matthew and Mark as well. They're, they each wrote their own account of the life of Christ. And I'm, I'm not including John because John's a whole other monster, you might say. It's a whole different style of writing, different subject matter, and things like this. Anyway, so let's get into it. The, the first chapter of Luke has a lot of information, particularly about John the Baptizer and his parents and his birth and the announcement of Christ's birth. But I want to start, obviously, in the first four verses here of Luke's account. It's pretty interesting. Well, who is Luke? Yeah, he's mentioned three times in Scripture. I've got it written down here. Colossians 4.14, Paul calls him the beloved physician. So Luke is a doctor. Now I've got an interesting, I've actually got it in a three-ring binder, three-inch three-ring binder. 
uh, and it's called the medical, uh, something like the medical language of St. Luke. Pretty interesting book. Noticing the, the Greek language, some of the words and, and phrases that Luke employs as a doctor in his writings. So he's mentioned in Colossians 4.14 as a doctor, and then also in 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philemon verse 24 as a, as a co-worker and a co-traveler with Paul. And another interesting thing about Luke is when you're reading the, the book of Acts, uh, and I've actually got this written down, just, and this is for my own benefit, uh, in that, on that blank page between Matthew and Malachi, I just made some notes here about the four gospel accounts. Luke uh, inclu- is also the author of the book of Acts, and you see him uh, mentioning himself in what's called the we sections. He doesn't mention himself by name, but he'll be writing about somewhere Paul was going, and he says, we, we did this or we did that. That's at, at, we find that in Acts chapter 16 and 17, Acts chapters 20 and 21, and then chapters 27 and 28. Uh, so when he opens up his gospel account here, he notes some things that are interesting for his time. And I think that should be interesting for us too and help us appreciate the fact that we have Scripture. Not, and not just the fact that we have Scripture, but that we have an inspired by the Holy Spirit account of the things that happened during the life of Christ. So he says, "...insomuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which, we, which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us." Now I find that interesting. Luke does not call himself an eyewitness, that is, an eyewitness of Christ. He says, "...just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them." To us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you, in which you were instructed. So again, this is a very unique introduction. You look at the other gospel accounts. Matthew starts with the uh, with the genealogy of Christ. Mark just starts with the beginning of Jesus's work. I mean, he jumps right pretty much right into the baptism of. Jesus, and then the temptation, and then Jesus' ministry. Luke looks around him and says, all right, a lot of people have written about this, about what I'm going to write about. And so I've just made some notes here, again, in the margin of my Bible. Number one, you notice many people in the first century were already writing about Christ. Uh, Verse one, they attempted to be orderly, according to what Luke says here. And here's something I think that's important to, to notice um, what Luke says in verse 1, the things which have been, the, the New King James says, fulfilled among us. The Greek word there means um, uh, fully proven or, or fully established. The life of Christ was being documented in the first century by a lot of different people. Now again, uh, a lot of these people were not obviously inspired writers like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there were a lot of people who took time and put effort into writing accounts. And Luke says, well, I'm capable of giving you an, um, uh, a, what the eyewitnesses saw, now what I know, and I'm capable of giving that to you by inspiration and in an orderly fashion. And Luke even sa- the way Luke says that here um, in chapter 1 and verse 3, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. That word perfect in the Greek is akribos, accurate. I have an accurate understanding of what happened from the very first to write to you an orderly account, a successive or a chronological account. So again, Luke is very unique in what he's doing here as compared to, again, not only Matthew, Mark, and John, but also other people who had taken it upon themselves to begin writing. Luke is not plagiarizing here. He's not copying off of Matthew. He's not borrowing from Mark. He's considered all these other writings, he's aware of them, but he's saying, now I'm going to give you an accurate, successive account of these things that have been fulfilled, these things that we know. And in fact, what he says of Theophilus here, that you may know the certainty of those things, that that is the firmness or the fact that these things have been confirmed. You know, believe it or not, there are people who even question the the life, the, the existence of Christ itself. Was he a real person? Did he really exist? Luke says, yeah, and a lot of people have written about it. Now, here's an orderly and successive, successive account. Luke is not 
borrowing from borrowing from anybody here. He's writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit this account, and um, he's writing to this guy by the name as he's called here, excellent Theophilus. Uh, Acts chapter one, and that's one of the reasons we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. Uh, when you turn over there, let me turn over there just real quick. Uh, Acts chapter one. Uh, the former account I, meet, I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. That's how we know Luke wrote Acts. Um, he wrote the doings and the teachings of Christ. But here in Luke, he's called most excellent Theophilus. Acts just calls him Theophilus. Uh, most excellent signifies a rank. Some people say, well, Theophilus, when you look at his name there, Theos, God, uh, phileo, love, lover of God. So some people take the position that, well, Theophilus, that wasn't a real person. That's just, you know, Luke was writing to a bunch of people who loved God. No, Theophilus was a person, and one reason I know that is because of this word excellent. And that, in, in the Greek, that's a term of, of rank, a, a term of position. Whoever he's writing to is a powerful person, and his name is Theophilus. Uh, names were quite different then than they are today. Names had significant meaning, were often tied into family, tradition, and things of this nature. So that's Luke's introduction, verses 1 through 4. A lot of people have written about this, but I'm going to do it successively, and I'm going to do it accurately, because I have an accurate understanding. So the first thing, he, the, the, the place he starts writing about the life of Christ is about John the baptizer. And he introduces us, beginning in verse 5, to John's family or John's parents, that is, Zacharias and Elizabeth. This is all taking place, these events are taking place, as it says in verse 5 here, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Herod's an interesting character. Um, this is not the only place we read about him in the New Testament, obviously. I was reading a book that was talking about Herod, and in that book he was called the Savage of Idumea. Um, this was a brutal man. Uh, he was in power from 37 to 4 B.C. It's in, this, it's in his lifetime that these things are taking place. And incidentally, same, same period of time as uh, the birth of Christ. John's parents are named here, Zacharias and Elizabeth. They are descendants of Aaron. Um, he is a priest. Zechariah is a priest of the division of Abijah. You can go back to 1 Chronicles and... You can read about the divisions of the priests that, uh, that David created. There were 24 divisions of priests so they could serve in order and, and you know, keep things orderly and, and fulfill the, the, the work of the service of the temple. Mother's name is Elizabeth, but I want you to, what I want to pay attention here more than anything is what they, what's said about them in verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. What does it mean to be righteous? It means to be right. Now, these people were living under the Old Testament. You know, read Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 sometime where it talks about the, uh, the carnal or the fleshly services of the law of Moses, the, the work that had to go on, the sacrifices that had to be made. There are a lot of people today in religion who are preaching supposedly in the name of Christ who tell us, you know, hey, you can't, you can't be righteous. You can't do all these commandments. It's not possible. You know, after all, we're just sinners. Uh, people who say that kind of stuff don't understand the fact that it's like John says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's not too much to bear. And to say that we can keep God's commandments and be faithful is not the same as saying, hey, we're sinlessly perfect. We've never done anything wrong. It's just stating the fact that God has revealed his commands, and it's not impossible for us to do that. Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous before God. How do you do that? How can a person be righteous before God? Here it is. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's how you are made righteous. You do what God says do. And I mean, we can, that's explained here in Luke chapter 1 verse 6 and in various other places in the Old, in, in the, well, yeah, in the Old and the New Testaments. Righteousness is doing what is right as revealed by God in Scripture. That's all it means to be righteous. Um, the book of Romans talks a lot about righteousness. But it's interesting, when you look at Romans, it's bracketed by this statement. 
uh, Paul's purpose in writing is to talk about the obedience of faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 5 and Romans chapter 16 verse 26. The obedience of faith. Faith is not just believing that God is. Now that's part of it. Biblical faith is always active. It's always obedient. That's Hebrews chapter 11. It's always doing what God says do. So, Zacharias and Elizabeth, that's the kind of people they were. They were righteous because they were walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. The, the, the Christian can do that same thing today. Blameless doesn't mean sinless. It means you're doing what's right, and there's nothing that can be held against you in the sense of you're not doing God's will. You're righteous. So while he's serving in the temple, Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 12, an angel appears to him. And this is interest, an interesting occurrence. Um, he appears on the right side of the altar of incense, verse 12. And Zechariah, Zacharias, as I probably would be too, was afraid. He was troubled and great fear fell upon him. You're in there serving by yourself. And then here's this angel who appears in front of you. And he begins talking to him. By the way, this angel is the name. This is the angel by the name of Gabriel. Uh, this is the angel that also talks to Mary a little bit later in this chapter that talks to her about Jesus. There are only two angels in Scripture that are named, Michael and Gabriel. And, and this is just kind of a side note here, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but because I want to talk about it with specifically in regard to Mary and what Gabriel said to Mary. So we have Gabriel mentioned throughout the text here as talking to people about John the Baptizer, about Jesus himself, but, you know, supposedly the Koran, Islam's holy book, was revealed to, uh, what's his name, Muhammad, by Gabriel in a cave. The Koran says that Jesus is not the Son of God. The Koran was revealed by Gabriel, supposedly. Well, when you look at Luke chapter 1 here, Gabriel's talking to Mary. He's the son of the highest and the Lord God will... So one of these two books is wrong. Either the Koran is right, that was revealed by Gabriel, and says that Jesus was not the Son of God, or the Bible is right, where Gabriel is recorded as talking to Mary and saying, He is the Son of God. Both books can't be right. The God of the Koran is not the God of the Bible. The message of the Koran is not the same as the Bible. Period. It's just not. I've got three versions of the Koran in my office, uh, and I've read them each multiple times. Uh, there's nothing. They're not compatible. Let's just, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Anyway, so the angel appears to Zacharias as he's serving in the temple. That's Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. He has a message for him. Don't be afraid. Luke 1, 13, Zacharias, your prayer is heard. Well, what prayer? For a son. They had been praying for a son, and you're going to call him John. That's going to come out a little bit later in Luke chapter 1 because that's the naming of a child, particularly in these days, was you need a family name. So uh, by calling John, John, that kind of breaks precedent. That does something that's not usually done. So here's Gabriel's definition, or definition, uh, description of John. Chapter 1, verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Why? For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Uh, so when you look in the Old Testament, and this is Numbers chapter 6, you have this, uh, the Israelites could take a vow called the Nazarite vow, where they wouldn't drink wine or strong drink or anything that was produced by the vine, but they also wouldn't cut their hair. Uh, John was not a Nazarite. He wasn't taking that vow. This is just saying that he wouldn't drink wine or strong drink. He's also going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? You know, a lot of people today talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I did a 13 lesson, 13 video series on um, the Holy Spirit. A lot of people throughout Scripture were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what that always has to do with is inspiration and revelation. John's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. The interesting thing is, and by way of contrast, Jesus and John, or I'm sorry, Jesus and the apostles all performed miracles. 
John the baptizer did not perform miracles. John chapter 10 and verse 41 tells us that. So what this idea is of being filled with the Holy Spirit has to do with revelation. So let me just show you what I'm talking about here in this same chapter. Uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 41. This is when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Uh, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke. And then you also look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 67. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying. That's the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen, here's, here's just another example. Um, Acts chapter 6 and 7, Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about John being filled with the Holy Spirit. What's John going to do? Well, Luke chapter 1 and verse 16 says, And he will turn many of, children, of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. John's message was repentance. And we see that in the other gospel accounts. Particularly when you look at Matthew chapter 3, he came preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8, he told his audience, you need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. That was John's message. He's preparing people for something. You need to repent. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Uh, what Luke does there in Luke 1.17 is he quotes an Old Testament passage, Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, and applies it to John. John came in the spirit, as it says here, in the spirit and power of Elijah. He wasn't Elijah, the person, the prophet. He had the same type of, I guess I would say, uh, personality, methods. Uh, he dealt with the same type of people. Elijah prophesied in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. John's uh, prophesying in the days of Herod. They're dealing with the same situations, and they have the same way about them, you might say. Uh, in fact, Jesus says in Matthew 11, for, uh, 11, verse 14, that John is this Elijah. And that's what it's talking about. He, he functions in the same way as a prophet of God. Um, so he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Again, John's message is repentance. To, and, and then he says this, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was a trailblazer. He went before Christ. And even, and we see this particularly in the gospel of John, him being questioned, are you that prophet? No, I'm just the light. I'm bearing witness to him, but um, I am not that prophet. Uh, that prophet is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18. John the baptizer was the forerunner. He was preparing the way for Christ and getting people's hearts ready for, for uh, Jesus and for his message. So you're going to have a son, you're going to call him John, and here's what he's going to do. That's what Andriel told, that's what the angel Gabriel told Zacharias, John's father. Well, how do I know this? I'm old, my wife is old. Um, well, I'm going to give you a sign, because you didn't believe my word. Uh, you'll be mute, you'll not be able to speak, until these things are fulfilled, until John is born. So uh, he's still in the temple serving. Everybody's outside. They're waiting for John to come, or for Zacharias to come out. Um, well, when he came out, he couldn't speak. Luke chapter one verse twenty one. And again, that's tied in with you know how can this happen? I'm too old. My wife's too old. Gabriel uh, told him why this would happen. So look, verse 23, Luke 1, 23. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to go to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself for five months. Why would you hide yourself for five months? Well, he's old, she's old, and now she's pregnant. That might be a little embarrassing. There might be some questions to answer uh, from the community. Regardless, she hides herself for five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among the people. Uh, being childless was considered a, an affliction even. When you look at Hannah, Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 1, she talked about her affliction, not, not being able to have a child. And that when she was um, pregnant with uh, Samuel, the Lord had taken that affliction away. Rachel, when she gave birth to Joseph, said, The Lord has taken away my reproach. Well, 
Zacharias and Elizabeth find themselves in the same situation. God has taken away their reproach among the people. So I'm going to stop right there for today. I've already been going for about 25 minutes. Um, but that's Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. The, the announcement of the birth of John the baptizer, the type of person he was going to be, the type of people that his parents were, and um, the role that he was going to play. So when we start, and I don't think I'm going to be able to go live tomorrow. Um, I've got too much going on tomorrow. I may just come back Wednesday at 11. But when we pick up, pick up in Luke chapter 1, we'll get to verse 26. Gabriel's already spoken to Zechariah. Now he's going to go talk to Mary about the birth of Jesus. Uh, so I see one comment on here. I know some who believe that John was Elijah. Yeah, and so if a person does believe that, uh, you can just take them over to Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus is talking about John. Um, Matthew eleven thirteen. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he, John, is Elijah who is to come. He's not Elijah. He is coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's what Luke chapter 1 and verse 17 says. So, Bible's its own best commentary, isn't it? Okay, well, I appreciate all of you being on here today. Again, if, if any of this sparks any questions or comments, throw them here in the comment section. Send me a message. Uh, like I said, I, I, I can't live stream tomorrow. I'm just going to have to come back and do it on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So, thanks for being on here today. Uh, you can, I'm going to upload this to YouTube. Uh, if people don't, somebody doesn't do Facebook, you can send them to YouTube if they might be interested in studying through Luke's gospel. Thanks for being on here today, and I plan on seeing you Wednesday at 11 Central.